Strategies magazine. Welcome to our broadcast tonight, our tea time broadcast tonight. We are talking about leadership today, about how to um, manage your own anxiety as a, as a leader, how to become a leader in your own life. And I'm so delighted to be joined with top coach Liz Beck. Hello, Liz. Lovely to see you. Hi, Susie. Lovely to be with you. I know we we were chatting the other day and uh, I just thought, my goodness, I would really like to invite you onto Psychologies TV to talk about. So it's, it's a really hard time to to kind of be uh, to know how to do it and how to lead. So where do we start to sort of really dig deep and find our inner leader, especially when we're we're trying to lead a virtual team? Where do we start? Uh, well, it's a really great question and a challenging one. There's no two ways about it. I don't think there's an easy answer for any of this, but I think that. Um, for ourselves, whether we're leading families or whether we're leading teams or organisations or, you know, governments, you've only got to look at the US debate the other night to um, to see what it might not want to look like. Yeah. Uh, and you notice that actually really the first place we have to start is inside ourselves. And what I mean by that is finding some sense and, um, if necessary, activities and process that help us just quieten down the noise there is so much going on around our heads. There's so much external uh, messaging and influencing that it's very easy and understandable that we all get in a state of um, angst and confusion and chaos and increased pace. And, you know, quieting down some of that noise, just unplugging, even for short gaps, you know, it may not be possible to get the week or two week on the, in the sun right now because of COVID, but we can go for a 20 minute walk and we can just quieten down some of that noise that I think is really important important for the system to settle i mean i think i mean you're you're hitting on a really interesting point because it's not only the covid anxiety that's that's kind of attacking but we've also got this whole thing of working from home yeah so our kind of boundaries between work life and office life have become blurred yeah um, and i know i've been talking to my friends who some of them have got really really high powered jobs and banks and stuff and they're saying mm -hmm. all they hear is bing 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 mm -hmm. of their phone constantly and they and they know not to go and have a look at it but they're like oh well i'll just check yeah and it, it's, it's like literally having your boss sitting you know beside you on the sofa you know, <laughs> while you while you watch the the latest documentary on netflix so yeah. how, how do we how do we deal with that how do we how do we create really strong boundaries between work life and home life what would you advise yeah, it's, it's interesting. As you were saying, that was reminding me of a call I had earlier today with a senior leader in hospitality. You can only imagine what her world is like right now. Um, she's only really traveling from work to the various locations and checking in, dealing with all of the challenges of pretty much zero revenue for the last few months. And so there's that massive blur. Everything's leaking into every other part of her life. And the you know the pot is full and overflowing the exhaustion's um clear in her voice and she's starting to feel it manifest physically so i think that point you make about boundaries is really important and do we know what they are for ourselves boundaries won't just appear by magic they won't appear just because we thought about them and they won't be the same for all of us we'll each need to set our own so some time to consider what what would be right for me where are the moments in my day and my life where I can, A, know I'm at my best to perform or deliver for family, yeah. for self, for work? Okay, that goes into the schedule. Where are the times when I'm really not? That's not a time to keep squeezing the lemon. If the juice is run through, then that's the time to rest and recuperate. You wouldn't see an athlete consistently run around the 100-meter track until it until they dropped. So. Yeah. You know, we have to invest in our mind, body and soul restoring as well. So yeah. working out what are those points in the schedule and what are the boundaries you need for yourself to be your best. And that thinking comes first and potentially writing it down, sharing it with others, building it into a schedule, engaging a colleague, a PA, a friend, a family member yeah. to help put the disciplines in place for it. One crazy thing I started doing, probably, well, not that crazy at all, I'm sure, but April, May time, when it was getting into the system, I decided the phone could not be the alarm clock anymore. Yeah. The phone could not come upstairs. It had to stay down. 
yeah. oh, how, oh, you know, lots of noise in my head about, well, how else are you going to do it? Like, we've all forgotten you can buy an alarm clock. But actually, I just plugged the kids' Amazon Alexa and chose to wake up to classical music instead of waking up to the news or waking up to the alarm or having the yeah. apps and the Instagram beep at me straight away. It's made an enormous difference to my mornings. Yeah. I mean, again, it's it's consciously creating your day, isn't it? Consciously exactly right. how you want it to be. I remember when we were at Psychologies, we, we worked from home for a long time, for three or four years. So I've been kind of running a virtual team, but we took a long time to get it right. So there was a piece where, you know, as the editor, you know, I just, I I worked funny hours and I would mm -hmm. text people or email people. And then they were, they really, my team were like, you can't do that. Yeah, because good. then I think I've got to reply. And it didn't even occur to me. I didn't, there was no expectation for me that they were going to reply. And it came to a head when I emailed, I had an idea in the middle of the night, I emailed my um, my deputy, she emailed me back. Oh. <laughs> And it was like, what are we doing? We can't sleep. And so we had to have a really big, as a team, we had to have a really big discussion mm -hmm. about what was acceptable and what was not, what our expectations were as working as a team. Yeah, so good. if you're working with a team and then you're working with leaders, mm -hmm. and senior leaders, what kind of advice do you give um, around running a virtual team? Yeah, I, I love the expression you used just now about choosing it consciously. Um, you can't see it, but on the wall behind me is a, is a model that we work to quite often. And one element of it, organisationally, is to choose a conscious culture. Um, that is to say, not one that you accidentally fall into or happen to be a part of or somehow find out you don't like. If you are a leader, you co-create the culture consciously. You have the freedom to choose it and set the pace. And if you're a culture of the whole organization or even your sub teams you could argue we have a culture in our individual selves making sure that it's one you choose consciously and you're creating it by engaging others around you is so important we we all have our own maps of the world and start just assuming that the way we're living our lives is the way our colleagues are and just sort of unwittingly trampling on those maps is is unreasonable and unhelpful for performance so you know in your example that's I've learned to, to type the email if that's where my brain is and then save it, not send it. And then in yeah. the morning I can send it, right? But yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. having those open conversations, and I think in one of the other parts of that model behind me that this is sitting on is the notion of psychological safety. Is it okay in my team, my family, my relationship, my organization to say, mm, I'm not okay with that. Don't do it to me. Now, if you live in any... Um, relationship that's not feeling safe psychologically, you've got any concern of not being perfect or being first or being best or whatever it might be, then you may not say, I'm not okay with that, don't do it. And what was lovely in your example is clearly the team felt very comfortable <laughs> to say, <laughs> but it's not true everywhere. And so, you know, this has always been true for leaders. I think it's never more true in a COVID virtual world, much more co-creation is necessary much yeah. more understanding that one size doesn't fit all is necessary and and leaders being able to create a safe environment for their their teams is is really the only way they're going to get performance and therefore get what they want you know productivity wise sure. i mean we we've found things just some really simple rules around our whatsapp group so we have a kind of a team yeah. WhatsApp group and at the beginning of covid mm. we were like oh my god have you seen this in the news and da, da. and then we went no stop this is only good news this is our only good news whatsapp so it's like whenever you hear that ping and it's from the work whatsapp you know that it's going to be positive life affirming um good news um mm -hmm. and rather than that kind of feeling of dread of yeah. armor or you know that that maybe sometimes you have in other whatsapp groups um so again it's it's just about i, I love the idea of uh, consciously creating a culture and it's like, well, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And maybe so. Do when you're doing that as a leader, what sort of questions do you, do you sort of take it out to the team and say, what do we want to create here? And 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 as you say, co-create with the team what they want or the company. How how does it yeah, work? Yeah, exactly. Well, exactly that. Well, very um, very interactively, very creatively and practically, preferably in a room. It's not always possible. It can be done virtually, but really, it's about saying look, whilst I choose to be in this organisation, and let's remember it is a choice, we all have the option. Whilst I choose to be in this organisation, the primary question is, 
what will best serve its goals? What is it here to do? And what is our role in helping it do that? It's an entity full of humans. So humans make whatever it is. And so we have to think about what is the environment that will bring the best performance and the best productivity, the best comfort and behavior for all of the humans in that organization. And that will, by definition, produce the results. It's not, it's not the results that drive it. It's the way the people operate that bring the results. And so, yeah, it's a very um, creative, often post-it notes and Lego and creative arts and outdoor activities combined with the cognitive processing, really, I suppose you would call it, that needs to think about, actually, we've got, we've got some margins to deliver. We've got some customer supply chain to manage. We've got to think all of these commercial elements through. But knowing that they are the output of how the humans engage. So, yeah, really interactive and asking people. I mean, I, I feel inc incredibly privileged at Psychologies because I have a team. I always say it to my publisher. I always say I've got a team that really care. Mm. And by that, you just cannot buy this. No. But if they, they go the extra mile always to, to create this amazing magazine, which is amazing. But it's it's you know sometimes I, you know i've worked in other organizations when it's not the case and how do you um is there a way to engage people to get them to care because you know if you've got somebody on your team or a few people in the team who's just like i don't care you know mm. i think that must be really difficult and what's your advice about engaging people especially when you're working online you know mm. you suspect that they are putting 50 percent of energy efforts and maybe hours in how do you get them to re-engage well i think you're touching on an area where a number of things will all be true at the same time um so this is where i see people respond to those kind of questions with one stock answer you know it's, it's either this or it's that um, in my experience that's not typically the case but i think we see a lot about corporate values they're not my favorite thing if i'm honest really what tends to get the kind of outcome you're describing is what people believe inside their system, inside their heart and their soul. Do they believe either in the endeavor of the organization or the, the leader or leaders themselves as, as individuals? Do those people have their faith and their energy and do they feel inspired by them? And so I think you know, engagement is about tapping into that stuff and, and checking if people feel that this is something they want to be a part of is either this is an organization they want to contribute to because it's doing something in the world or this is a leader they want to serve and sometimes there's just a real reality that some people have to work because they have to put food on the table yes and that's their driver and that's okay so i think leaders have to be pragmatic and open to the different motivators for humans and talk to people on an individual um basis about those really you may have some people who are uh, working virtually and performance drops, although that hasn't been the typical COVID experience. No. It's been the opposite. So faith in humans, if you are able to um, connect with them well, can bring phenomenal results. If you find there are the exceptions, you know, explore it with them. Ask what's going on here and say what you see and notice what you notice and inquire. Um, it may be that at the end of all of that, this isn't a place that's a great match and it's time to co-create how to move on from it but there's a, there's a whole load of conversation that's valuable first yeah but i love the idea of uh, just being able to state you know it, it feels like you know all i hear from you is this or i'm worried about da, 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 yeah. da. just being yeah. having kind of very straightforward conversation i mean my, my team do it to me and they'll say susie you know i've noticed that you haven't been online da, 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 da. are you okay yeah, exactly. They came, which is really, again, which comes from a place of care, and I love that. Um, well, it removes judgment. Yeah. And it's not making assumptions. It's not putting judgment in place. It's saying, I notice and I'm curious. I want to make an inquiry. I want to learn. I want to see how we can support, and, and then we'll go from there. Sure. Yes. So it's it's being and then it's it's being able to have honest conversations, isn't it? I mean, and, and again, it's that. I kind of firmly believe what you just said earlier about psychological safety, you know, um, and I know that I certainly thrive and my team thrive when we feel safe enough to have those difficult conversations. Um, but when we don't, you mm -hmm. know, when 
because often what what it's like is I hear on you know out there that you know most people leave the boss not the job Mm -hmm. Um, and when you have um, a a boss that you feel doesn't have your best interests at heart or you know a toxic colleague or Mm -hmm. and I'm not a great believer in that I'm a believer in toxic dynamics you know, mm-hmm. and that, that so that makes me feel like I've always got a choice in the way I change the dynamic. Mm-hmm. But how do we how do we handle that, especially when it's when it's online and and you know virtual working? Is there a, is there a good way to sort of manage that or work with that or um, a good languaging to use when you know you feel that it's a little bit toxic or it doesn't feel it doesn't feel good. Well, as a recipient of it, um, if that's what you're, you're suggesting, I think you know, there's no magic bullets with these things. They all come back to some fairly simple um, principles. If we're feeling threatened, if we're feeling fear, that's not a healthy place to be. It's also not a productive place to be. So you might find some of the old command and control in organisations gets you a short term jump. It's not going to get you sustainable outcomes. And that's that's the survival response in us all. You know, we want to get away from the pain or the fear of it. And so if you're feeling that, one thing you can do is start to share that with somebody else who you trust. Look around for your tribe. Look around for the people who uh, may be experiencing something similar, may have reached out to you before. You've noticed they've been a support to other people who found themselves slightly marginalized. But start to put a voice to it so that you get to own it rather than it's owning you. Yeah. Um, it's so very powerful when we speak our truth. Something shifts and changes in how it's being done to us. Um, and if if need be, take advice on how to voice that to the to the person or persons you're feeling on the receiving end of it from. There are legal processes. Of course, you can raise a grievance. Of course, you can escalate it. But it might be manageable to start with yeah. sharing it with someone and taking it again say what you're feeling or seeing and and get curious I'm feeling like this is that how you intend me to feel is this something we need to recontract for in our relationship this doesn't feel good right now how is it for you turn the tables great that's great I love that I I mean again it's you know just hearing the language hearing the vocabulary about how to bring that up Mm. um, it's it's you know it's that's really that's really strong because often we don't know how to do it. We've got a really great piece in the magazine this month about bullying at work, you know, mm-hmm. and someone really describing how that felt. And, you know, she she felt a very assertive woman. She couldn't believe that someone like her yeah. would feel like that. And sort of she she's describing actually with what you went through, you know, the, the kind of vocabulary and, 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 you know, sort of challenge, being able to challenge it to the person and say, this is not acceptable. How am I going to, you know, do this differently? Yeah. And there's something about taking your power back. And I don't mean power in the hierarchical sense. I mean the centered sense. When you're on the receiving end of something that makes you feel fearful or small or shrinking, that can be very paralyzing. By putting voice to it or even putting voice to the person in question, um, you just get a bit of balance. You just get a bit more adult, adult going on. And you can start to even up the tables. You can start to feel your strengths again and have some conversations. Yeah, I mean, I think that that I was just talking about it in one of our uh, interviews this morning about the kind of the drama triangle, mm. you know, where, yeah. as you say, and also the kind of adult to adult relationship rather than, you know, being afraid of someone or, yeah. you know, it's and that, that weird dynamics. But as soon as you become an adult, adult to adult, it, it, you, as you say, you claim back, you reclaim power. Absolutely right. It's really great. Liz, thank you so much for talking oh. to us today. I know that you oh, work with organisations all over the country. All of the links, that you, you're, you're about to launch big campaigns, you're helping. Instead of just tick boxing for people um, around our new kind of home working, I know that you're doing a lot of work mm. around really creating proper change in companies. So if you want to hear yeah. about what Liz is doing, all the links are below, so do click on it. It's been an enlightening conversation today, Liz. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank and you, Susie. Talk to, uh, to us again soon. Lots of love. love. And you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.